Uh, welcome everyone to another session of the data learning seminars. Today we have Gege Wan. She is an incoming assistant professor at Imperial College, co-appointed by the Earth Science and Engineering Department and the newly launched Imperial X Initiative. She obtained her PhD in Energy Sciences and Engineering at Stanford University. And prior to that, she did her MS in Fluid Mechanics and Hydrology from Stanford University MBS in Mineral, Mineral Engineering and University of Toronto. Uh, Gaga, thank you for sharing your time with us, and please uh, go ahead. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for having me. Um, so the talk um, title is CO2 Geological Storage Modeling with Machine Learning. And I really like this figure that I um, usually start my talk with this figure. Um, this figure is a really nice illustration of um, the energy transition, and more interestingly, um, what is the relationship between energy transition and the subsurface? So at the subsurface, we can see uh, a portfolio of technology, and at the surface, we can also see a portfolio of technology to generate energy. So for example, we can see hydro in here, uh, here is solar, here is onshore wind, here is offshore wind, and um, there's a natural gas power plant. And at the subsurface level, we can, for example, sequester the CO2 that was produced from the natural gas power plant. And we can use this um, solar with water splitting technology and produce hydrogen. And we can st also store the hydrogen in the subsurface as a form of energy storage. Um, similarly, we can store compressed air as another uh, form of energy storage. And we can do it as a similar manner to hydro where um, we store these energy uh, during a period of excessive power, and we use this energy when we uh, during winter or night when we need them. And um, this figure really shows that subsurface will play a very important role during the energy transition. And one common theme, one common theme in these different subsurface um, technology is physics simulation. We would want to use these physics simulation to simulate what's going to happen when we um, pump fluid into the subsurface, how much pressure buildup we will see, and where this fluid is going to go. And my research um, lies in the intersection of artificial intelligence and physics simulation. And specifically uh, in today's talk, I will demonstrate how these capability of artificial intelligence can impact physics simulation through the problem of CO2 geological storage. So to demonstrate this problem of CO2 geological storage, I want to show this video that was made by uh, my collaborators at NVIDIA in their Omniverse. And this video shows that CO2 is being captured somewhere um, and transported from the pipeline. It can come from a power plant, like I showed earlier in the figure, or it can come from an industrial source or even a direct air capture facility. And once the CO2 is pumped into a storage site, it can be distributed into a couple of different injection wells. And as we're adding the CO2 into the subsurface, we are creating this pressure buildup. And the things that we re really need to um, monitor when we inject CO2 into the subsurface, one thing is the maximum pressure buildup. Um, the maximum pressure buildup is very important because we want to make sure it is not too high that we might pot potentially fracture our reservoir. Or we also need to monitor whether we, need to tr we will trigger any earthquake or any leakage. The other thing that we really care about is the pressure footprint. So the pressure footprint refers to the area where we cause a um, disturbance in the pressure um, in the reservoir because of our injection activity. So that is how large the pressure has gone to. And for example, in the United States, this quantity is required by the regulatory agency when we apply for permits to inject CO2. So they need to know how much of a pressure footprint we're causing. So besides pressure, at the same time, we also care about the CO2 gaseous saturation plume and how the CO2 gaseous saturation plume evolves in the reservoir. Um, so for this movie, uh, 
to make it uh, present better on screen. Um, we didn't use one-to-one -one aspect ratio. So it may seem that the plume is very tall, but in, in reality, these plume will travel a lot faster on the lateral direction than the vertical. So these plume will actually be very large um, laterally. And we need to know where the plume has gone to. And uh, one reason is that we need to make sure that there are no abandoned well or any fracture in the area that the plume has gone to, otherwise it may also cause leakage. So this is also something that uh, in the United States required by the regulatory agency for um, us to calculate when we apply for permits to inject CO2. Another thing that we want to know is the sweep efficiency factor. So sweep efficiency factor refers to the um, volume of the gaseous plume divided by the volume of total footprint. So we want to optimize for sweep efficiency so that we can use a smaller land uh, space and have a um, have more CO2 stored in this land space. So currently, numerical simulation is the um, is the best and uh, almost the only way to solve for these multi-phase flow for CO2 storage. Uh, at a poor scale, uh, multi-phase flow is. Uh, this 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 animation shows the multi-phase flow through porous media. Um, the issue with numerical simulation is that these um, simulations are typically very time consuming. For poor scale, it is almost impossible to run uh, a reservoir scale to to simulate for a reservoir scale project using these poor scale simulation that are governed by um, neighbor stoves. So in reservoir scale, people typically uh, use the multi-phase variation of Darcy's law. And um, here is the mass and ba energy balance equation for Darcy. We have the change in mass equals to the flux plus the source term. And for each component of CO2 or water, we have the um, mass written in this form. And the flux is governed by this multi-phase variation of Darcy. So we have the permeability that governs the, uh, that tells us the ability for flow to go through porous media. Um, this is one important factor. The other one is this relative permeability curve. So think of the relative permeability curve as describing the gas and um, liquid phase fighting for this pore space. So they have a trade-off in permeability. And we also have a capillary pressure curve that is also a function of liquid phase saturation that describes the pressure of gas phase exerting on the liquid phase. Notice that these are all dependent of the saturation and these are inside this flux term. So these together makes this equation very uh, difficult to solve, although we are already making these averages in a reservoir scale. And we use, uh, need to use iterative solvers to calculate the pressure, the saturation, and the equation of state. So that was the, um, the nature of the problem, which is multi-phase. We also have multi-physics and multi-scale. So for multi-physics, we need to couple our simulation with um, thermodynamics, geomechanics, or reactive chemistry um, when we simulate CO2 uh, and its interaction with uh, subsurface water. And also we have this problem of multi-scale. So we need really high resolution to simulate the CO2 plume um, because the CO2 plume has high viscosity and it will form a really thin um, uh, gravity ton under the cap rock that requires really high resolution to simulate. But at the same time, we also have this really large problem domain. The pressure can travel far beyond the gaseous plume as I showed earlier in the animation. And on top of that, we also need to th simulate things for a very long period of time. Uh, CO2 storage can typically go for hundreds, a uh, decades to hundreds of years. So these all make the numerical simulation very time consuming. But on top, on top of that, we also have the geological uncertainty that is inherent to us. So that requires seismic inversion, history matching, uncertainty quantification, sequential decision making, or optimization. And each of these requires repetitive forward simulation of these already very um, computationally challenging simulation. So that is the problem being presented uh, to us in the CO2 storage domain. And to tackle this challenge, we ask this research problem, can we make a machine learning powered general purpose numerical simulator alternative to help us 
with these simulations. In other words, we want to design, build, and train a novel machine learning model to provide an alternative to running these numerical simulations. And the goal is to provide the flu fluid flow prediction that are significantly faster with high resolution and also comparable accuracy to simulation. So in the next part uh, of this talk, uh, I will take you through how we um, try to tackle this problem with different stages uh, from a proof of concept to a reservoir scale 2D problem and to uh, most recently a basin scale 3D problem. And during this process, we have also kept refining uh, the model that we use um, to improve the learning efficiency and generalizability. So our earliest uh, inspiration came from computer vision community. And it was back in 2018, uh, I took a course on computer vision and I learned about this cool algorithm that trains um, using large data sets of input output pairs um, of hand-drawn images versus the realistic images. And with this model train, it can transform a hand-drawn cat to this realistic cat image. Although nowadays um, we have already seen like Dali 3, Mid Journey, these look like ancient history. But at the time, what really struck me is that there, there is a really high dimensional mapping between the input and output, and we cannot write it in a mathematical form. But this model can represent this really high dimensional mapping. And once it's trained, it can provide us with this capability. And it really struck me. And I immediately thought, can we take this capability and apply it to our CO2 storage problem? So the CO2 storage problem can actually be a um, similar problem, a image to image problem, because we can think of the reservoir, uh, if we think of it as a 2D radially symmetrical reservoir, we can think of the problem be, uh, being the permeability mapped to the gas saturation, and it can be converted into this image of permeability mapped to this gas saturation. So now you can see the analogy between this CAT problem and our CO2 storage problem. So we went ahead and tested out our proof of concept. We designed this um, demo scale reservoir that is highly heterogeneous. And we chose different places where we want to inject CO2. And we chose different rates where we inject CO2. And we ran numerical simulation uh, and collected this uh, data set with 50,000 numerical simulation runs with very different proof shape. And then we train this CNN model for this demo scale problem that maps the input uh, into the output. So uh, we were able to get really high uh, quality results um, and that really motivated us to our later uh, research. Um, from this figure, you can see the left three are the input. The fourth figure is the ground truth from the numerical simulator. The fifth figure is the prediction from the machine learning model. And the last figure is the absolute error. Um, the prediction was really accurate. And the mean absolute error in the plume is 0.9% on on-scene data. So that was really encouraging. And we also established something really important with this work, that we were able to put engineering control into the system. And by that, we mean this perforation interval and also how, 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 uh, how what is the rate that we're injecting into the reservoir? So with this, it really motivated, motivated us to train a more general purpose tool that we can add engineering control into. So with that proof of concept, we then move on to a reservoir scale 2D problem that is much more realistic. And in the reservoir scale 2D problem, we before we training, tra started training any model, we took a step back and we tried to list out any uh, all of the items that are required in a conventional forward simulation um, setup. So that typically includes the step one input, step two numerical simulator, and step three output. So in step one input, we further uh, categorize the different type of input that we use in simulation. That includes the reservoir condition. So that can be pressure, temperature, reservoir thickness, and also sometimes reservoir dip angle. Uh, geological model. So this one includes the permeability, the porosity, heterogeneity, and also anisotropy. 
and then rock property. So this is the uh, the quantity that I showed about um, 10 slides, 20 slides earlier, the relative permeability and capillary pressure. These are very important for CO2 storage. And lastly, the injection plan, the rate, the location, and the schedule that we're injecting CO2. And for output, what we care um, in a CO2 storage problem is um, typically the pressure distribution, the gas saturation distribution, the swoop efficiency. And also there's something called solubility trapping. Solubility trapping uh, defines how much CO2 have dissolved in the formation fluid. And we want to calculate that um, percentage because a higher solubility trapping means the CO2 is more safe and secure in the subsurface. And also we have the mass balance. Is this amount of CO2 we inject the same as we, uh, is the amount of CO2 in the reservoir that has the same mass with the amount of CO2 that we inject? Uh, if these two match, we know that our simulation um, is pretty accurate. So with these uh, input and output laid out, we then wonder if we can sample the input ranges wide enough to cover most of the realistic scenarios that we're, we will encounter in real life. And also if we can design this output space to cover most of the practical use case. Can we propose this alternative route of using this machine learning model instead of numerical simulator when people run these numerical simulation? So to achieve that, we um, collected a even more diverse uh, data set and we sample each of the input and output according to our knowledge to the subsurface. For example, we know that the CO2 can only stay supercritical once it's below 800 meter. And when this, um, that's why we typically inject CO2 at a deep, uh, at a depth deeper than that. And also when the injection well is too deep, the cost of construction can be too high. Um, and that's why we also often limit our um, injection to between 800 and 3000 meters. So that kind of information can be used to guide us uh, design this data set. And we also sample the geological model, the permeability for a range as wide as possible to cover all of the cases that we can think of in the subsurface. And then we trained, uh, we designed this suite of uh, models. We call this CCSNet. It is a family of CN that is designed for the CO2 storage problem. And this uh, modeling suite includes a saturation CN, a pressure CN, two molar fraction CN in the middle, and two auxiliary um, density CN at the end. So. Each of these models uh, in the modeling suite is connected to either the input or some uh, previous model. And using these six models together, we can piece out everything on the right-hand side um, that we need for CO2 storage problem. <clears throat> so for example, if we take the saturation model as an example, we can see that it takes the input from uh, everything on the right-hand side and the output uh, first directly go into the output section and produces the CO2 plume distribution. And also the output is going into the molar fraction model to guide how much, um, what is the molar fraction of CO2 um, in the reservoir. So that was the modeling suite, uh, CCSNet. And we were able to get excellent prediction accuracy from each model. So this one is uh, an example from the pressure CN. The top row, we have the numerical simulator prediction, uh, and we predict the um, simulation result at different time steps, time snapshots over 30 years. And we take uh, the results from the first year, the 10th year, and the 30th year as an example. The second row is the uh, machine learning prediction uh, for the same time snapshot, and the third row shows the relative error. We can see that the um, prediction is very accurate and very encouraging, and the pressure R squared score can be as high as 0 0.996, and the saturation is 0 0.998, and the molar fraction models are also have very high R squared scores. Um, and besides the uh, accuracy in each of these models, 
uh, we also calculated the mass balance at the end using the outputs of each of these models. The mass balance can be calculated as a sum of uh, volume times saturation times um, times pore, pore, pore volume times molar pressure and times density. And the saturation can be predicted from our saturation CN. The pore volume is predicted from the pressure CN because the rock is compressible. We calculate the pore volume using the compressibility and the pressure buildup. And we also have these molar fracture models and the density models. And we can use all of the output to calculate the mass balance at the end. And we found that for both the liquid phase and the gas phase, the mass balance were actually matched pretty nicely. And we have a 95% confidence um, that the mass error is within plus or minus 1.5% over 30 years. So I want to note here that um, this is different from a physics informed um, setting where the where the mass balance can be uh, explicitly encoded in the loss function. We did not encode uh, the mass balance in the loss function. We just train it with a data-driven framework. And at the end, because we have such high accuracy in each of these models, the mass balance was actually be able to match pretty nicely. And um, for each of these models, uh, after we train, the biggest thing that we're gaining from this, doing this, is that we're getting four, 10 to the power of four times speed up. And to demonstrate how um, fast these models are, we hosted these models in a web application, CCSNet. So this is openly accessible. Uh, if you are interested, you can play around with it um, on your own, uh, ccsnet.ai. And we the, the interface will look slightly different because we have upgraded recently uh, to include more cases. So what I'm showing here is uh, the web app can generate a permeability map on the fly. And it sends this permeability map to the backend um, model. And it will immediately return this gas saturation plume um, this is the pressure buildup that's corresponding to this gas uh, to this permeability map. This is the reservoir pressure. Uh, here is the sweep efficiency factor calculated for you. And um, so um, we can also change the standard deviation for uh, for the um, for the permeability map. And you can immediately see that the gas saturation um, shows a much more heterogeneous plume compared to the case that we showed earlier. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. So um, from this web application, uh, you can calculate the gas saturation plume and pressure buildup in the reservoir um, that typically would take about half an hour, a couple of, or a couple of hours uh, using numerical simulator. And we are, we're getting 1,000 requests per day from global users, uh, currently, uh, without much of a promotion. So, um, Despite uh, the power of AI uh, demonstrated from these machine learning, uh, so from these examples and from the web applications, there was a catch. And the catch is that it took us 20,000 training data to simulate the, uh, uh, to, 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 to train these CCSNet model that were hosted in this web application. Although 20,000 training data was manageable for this problem, um, as we go forward into more complex problem domain, for example, 3D problems, um, the CM model can no longer be sufficient to help us support the predict uh, prediction capability. And that is when I started to look for other type of models. And um, very likely, I met this group from Caltech, and they've developed um, this fr new framework that specifically applies to scientific computing and it is called the foray neural operator. So that's when I transitioned from convolutional neural network to foray neural operator. 
So in the next uh, uh, five minutes, I want to give a quick introduction of how um, Fourier neural operator works. And to do that, um, first, we need to take a step back and show how CNN works. So take this image uh, as our input function. This is my puppy. His name is Doctor. And um, if we want to apply convolutional neural network on this input function f, we will come up with a convolutional kernel G that is the uh, red box, red checkerboard box showing here. And we slide this box across different locations on our input function F. And the writing out of this mathematically, we have the input function F uh, convolute with our kernel G. And note that in machine learning, the convolution operation is implemented as a um, cross correlation operation, but um, a performs the same, same, same with the same capability. Um, so because we use this uh, operation, our convolutional kernels are local because each time the kernel only looks at this uh, small portion in our input function x, uh, input function f. Um, the different from convolutional neural network. The Fourier neural operator uses the Fourier transform to learn kernels in the Fourier domain. And let's see what I mean by that. So we will start from our original image of our input function x, x, and we first do a fast Fourier transform on our input function. And after we do the FFT, we will get this 2D image at the bottom that doesn't really look uh, anything to us with human eye. But the really good feature about these Fourier neural uh, with, with these fast Fourier transform is that when we transform a natural image, we will most likely to have, um, we we'll almost always have the, the most important nodes located in the four corners of this FFT image. And because we know this, we can actually mask out the less important modes in the middle. And ap after we do the inverse Fourier transform, we can actually still recover really nice uh, quality image, even with just a tiny portion of the important mode. So the this uh, this really nice feature is actually used in every aspect of our life, uh, from image compression to video compression. If you are watching a YouTube video, actually even on Zoom, this is probably used in some part of the process. So. Because we have this really nice uh, feature, we can uh, the, the Fourier neural operator uses this feature and a uses in, in information compression, so the learning is more efficient. And also, in addition to that, the Fourier kernels are also resolution invariant, which helps with interpolation. So, to learn a uh, FNO model, we can think of us picking one mode that we like, that we believe can represent most of the information. And we apply a Fourier kernel onto this filtered uh, mode. And after we apply the kernel, we do the inverse Fourier transform. Um, this is just a demonstration, but in real life, here should be the output. And after we do this uh, inverse Fourier transform, we have one Fourier block. So because of this, the Fourier kernels are all good. Global and writing this out mathematically, we have the input function f convolute with g. So the FNO models were, were originally proposed for neighbor Stokes problem, and uh, we collaborated with these um, computer scientists in Caltech, and we designed this enhanced version of FNO for multi-phase flow, and this model name is UFNO. So the reason why we want to enhance this FNO for multi-phase flow is because multi-phase flow has some special treat. And um, one of that is, is, uh, is the fact that we have a gas saturation shock front, which is a quite a uh, discontinuous uh, jump on, uh, of saturation. So we enhance this with, the, with a uh, mini unit inside the FNO block and we were able to improve the accuracy for gas saturation at the shock front. Um, but at the same time, because the backbone is the FNO, we can still uh, take the advantage of FNO and filter out the noise to reduce the training data requirement. 
So here is a comparison between the UFNO model and the CN model. The blue curve is the CN, the red curve is the UFNO. On the x-axis, we have the uh, number of training samples, and on the y-axis, we have the test set uh, error percentage. So what this figure tells us is that to achieve the same test set error, the UFNO model only requires a fraction of the data uh, needed in CN. And uh, for more training samples, the uh, the, the advantage of using UFNO is more uh, prominent. So on the right-hand side, we also have this uh, little cartoon that shows the CN absolute error on the top and the UFNO absolute error at the bottom. You can see that the um, plume is nicely captured with the UFNO, even with these, uh, even in this very highly heterogeneous permeability map. So that concludes the second section uh, of reservoir scale 2D model. And with these, um, uh, with these uh, frameworks set it on the data set and also the advan uh, advancements in the ML model, it really motiv motivated us to go into tackle the most challenging problem, which is, uh, which is a 3D basin scale problem. So for the 3D basin scale problem, the challenge arises from the fact that there's a huge gap between the reservoir size and the required resolution for 3D reservoirs. So uh, consider this example uh, for a basin scale reservoir, a, 16, a 116 kilometer by 116 kilometer. And think of, uh, imagine that we are uh, simulating for a 100 meter thick layer. The ideal cell size we want to use, uh, let's set it at 20 by 20 by 20 uh, by two. That gives us a 3.2 billion cells in the entire basin scale domain, which is virtually impossible for a numerical simulator. So what people actually do is we will use a local grid refinement. Um, it is a popular approach to simulate different um, response at different resolutions. At the global scale, we can use coarser uh, grid, grid cells to capture the pressure response, but near the injection well, we need this high resolution um, grid cells to capture the CO2 plume and also the near well response. So using this local grid refinement, we can simulate the same reservoir size with the same finest resolution, but we use 3000 times less cells. So here is an example of this uh, simulation using a local grid refinement approach. On the top, we have the permeability in the reservoir. Uh, here we have four different injection wells. This is a dipping reservoir. So each of the injection well is injection, in, injecting at a different depth. And near the well, we can see this four level of grid refinement. And in the innermost, we are marking the well perforation using these black bars. And you can see um, the different well perforation, injection rate, and uh, permeability around each of the injection well. And at the bottom, we have the uh, response, the pressure build-up response uh, at 30 years in this full well case. And uh, we also have this uh, re result in the locally refined grids. So now the challenge becomes, can we train a machine learning model that can predict data with these local grid refinement? Uh, to tackle this challenge, we propose this architecture uh, with five different levels of models. At level zero, we are predicting for the most coarsest grid cells. And as we go from level zero to level four, we're gradually refining the grid cells. And at the, the, at the level four, we are predicting the, um, the finest grid cell near the injection well. And to make these models talk to each other, we're giving the output of each coarser level model into each finer level model. And uh, the output of each model uh, is mapped into the pressure buildup in these level of grid cells. So we call this the nested Fourier neural operator, nested FNO. And uh, for each pass, we will go through these five models. And each of the model is a FNO model. 
and it learns a 3D space-time mapping. Uh, so it's a actually a 4D FNL. So although the problem is very high dimensional and we have a very diverse um, data set, uh, because using FNL, we were able to reduce our training data size to only 3,000 simulations. And here is the entire architecture of the nested FNL. Uh, we, in addition to the five pressure models, we also have four gas saturation models at the bottom. And we do not have a global gas saturation model because we have carefully designed the grid so that the gas saturation plume is always retained inside the refined grid. So to simulate these uh, uh, 3D data sets, it takes about two to 16 hours for each simulation to run on a high computing cluster. And each simulation is parallel on 20 CPU. And the nested FNO after training takes about 0 0.25 seconds to 0 0.85 seconds to make each prediction on a 800 GPU. So that gave us up to 700,000 times speed up. So here is a uh, example of the um, prediction. On the top row, we have the numerical simulation um, new numerical simulation output for a three well case. And on the second row, we have the uh, nested FNOS prediction on the three well case. And uh, the last row shows the, the error. And I want to point to uh, the near well region here. We are actually seeing this uh, area where the gas saturation is almost one. So this is an effect called the dry out. So we have this because um, as we are injecting gas into the reservoir, the liquid phase in the uh, near well region was vaporized into the gas phase and got transported away from the injection well, uh, from the region near the injection well. So this is a really high dimensional response that requires three phase uh, transition. And it will actually uh, only show up when we simulate the reservoir with high resolution uh, high resolution grids, but necessarily doesn't know we're able to successfully capture this. So here is the similar uh, results in the same uh, three well reservoir. And the top row is the simulation the second row is machine learning model, and the third row is the relative error. And here is the global pressure in well one, well two, well three. So in the test set, the pressure buildup prediction it has a has a relative error of 0.5%, which is very accurate for the purpose that we're using these for. And we also have consistent performance across different reservoirs and different time steps. The left histogram shows the uh, mean uh, absolute pressure relative error. Uh, it ranges from 0% to uh, the maximum of 2%. And the um, relative error across the 30 year is pretty consistent. So that was the nested FNO model. Uh, before I wrap up, I want to show one last application um, to demonstrate why these models are super useful. Um, so this application is a optimization task uh, and we want to optimize for sequential building location for long-term CO2 storage safety. And uh, to decide where we want to drill the, uh, drill, the, drill the well, we want to optimize for these competing objective. One is to maximize CO2 trapping and the other is to minimize CO2 plume footprint. So when we optimize for these competing objective, it is, incredibly challenging and um, incredibly challenging for human expert to do this, but we can use uh, autonomous decision agent to choose the best action given a belief and a formulated reward. So this type, type of formulation is actually using autonomous driving or minimal uh, mineral exploration. And we combine these um, machine learning uh, simulation alternative with these uh, decision-making algorithm. And these decision-making algorithm can make the best plan that it requires a really high uh, number of four simulation. In this case, it requires one million flow prediction needed for each plan. And combining the machine learning model, we're able to enable this. So uh, that was the uh, 
that was a wrap on uh, what we have done on this topic. Um, I also want to quickly touch on uh, some future directions. Um, going back to this figure, we, you can see that now we have uh, applied to uh, to the problem. Uh, we, we have all, all now crossed out uh, some of the challenges in uh, the CO2 storage problem, uh, the reservoir stimulation, the thermodynamics, because we have always uh, predicted with the CO2 dissolved in the water. And also we have solved this problem of multi-scale, but there are still re uh, remaining challenges on this list um, that includes the geomechanics, the reactive chemistry, and also the poor scale physics. And that I think is a very interesting future um, research directions. So uh, here's a wrap on my talk and thank you very much for listening. Uh, I am happy to take any questions. Thank you, Gaga. That was a very thorough overview of what you've done um, with your great work. If you have any questions for Gaga, just um, leave them in the chat or you can raise your hand and ask. I think Phil before was asking about if these are 2D and or 3D models, but I think you already answered that question with the Well, these are really cool. I'm seeing these AI assistant helping people taking notes. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, can I ask you, um, when you use the, oh, sorry, there, there's a question from Matri. Thanks for the talk. I had a question. How generalizable is the training data? If this model needs to be applied in India instead of the US, will it need to be retrained, for example? Um. So we designed this uh, using a pretty comprehensive understanding of sedimentary basin. So if it's in India, um, if it's a sedimentary basin, uh, I think the model will be able to apply. Um, if there is special geology in this area, uh, we can also use these comprehensive model as the um, free train ways, and we can fine tune this model into the specific geology that somebody is interested in. So that will also save the computation cost. Thank you. There's a question from Vinicius. Great presentation. He says, any thoughts about incorporating physics constraints into these models? Um, yes, that is a great question. And it, I think it remains a open area in research. Personally, I have tried a couple of times in incorporating physics constraints, um, but my experience is that the physical constraint uh, has a uh, loss manifold that is very difficult for machine learning models to uh, reduce on. So my experiment, in my experiment, I typically found data-driven to be more uh, useful in physics constraint, but that is an open area and a lot of people are working on this and I'm also watching closely and hoping to see uh, any advancements in this area. Thank you. It's okay, Vinicius. Mm -hmm. On the on that avenue, um, what you say, like you, um, data driven maybe works better. Is it because you have access to lots of simulations, or? Um. So I can only speak from my experience and. Um, in my experience, these uh, CO two storage problem we have really complex the uh, governing equation. So I've shown our governing equation at the beginning. Um, right here. So we were able to put these governing equation inside the loss function. We actually uh, wrote out every uh, every step that is needed and put it in the in the uh, in the loss function. But um, when we calculate the residual, it's just one number representing a whole domain. And it's a really high dimensional domain. For each grid cell, we have the pressure, the saturation, the, uh, the molar fractions, the density. And when we condense it into one loss function, it's just one number. And for this one loss to be distributed back to each of the quantities inside the model, it is very challenging to reduce it. We can monitor the uh, the loss, the, the physics loss when we train with 
data driven. And we actually observe that uh, at the beginning of the training, the PD loss fluctuate a lot. And near the end of the training, when the uh, simulation is already very accurate, we can see the PD loss is decreasing gradually. But it's hard to start with the PD loss in the fluctuation zone. And um, the, 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 there's, there's ways to combine these to, to help with the training, but PD loss itself is hard. Okay. And, and in terms of like, um, when you try to predict the simulation, is that using like a rollout and to use the prediction for the next time step to, to get the next time step with the, with the FNOs? Yeah, I've tried uh, the rollout and also the uh, directly predicting the entire time domain. Um, so what I found is the uh, predicting the entire time domain is uh, easier than rollout because rollout we face the risk of uh, accumulating error along the way. Um, mm. You can also add inject noise or have different techniques to help with the rollout, but I typically find predicting together will be easier. So, so when you train them, when you train the model, are all the simulations have the same length, or, or yes, they... yes, that is the catch of the predicting these together. They they all need to be predicting the same uh, time domain. Okay, okay, yeah, because I was trying to use them for. Um for weather forecasting but if you start at, like you doing the prediction on top of the other one it just very quickly accumulates yeah yes okay, so was, okay. cool um uh, so another question from atri says i had another question are there any ecological impacts of subsurface storage such as on ground water tables or can they be mitigated Um, oh, that's a great question. So um, we need to be careful uh, when we inject into the subsurface. And in the United States, this that is uh, regulated by EPA when we inject. Um, that is why we need to calculate for that pressure buildup uh, and delineate how large the pressure buildup has gone to, because we need to compare that with the water, groundwater, the drinking water uh, aquifer, and make sure that we are not causing any problem into the drinking water aquifer. Another point is that we are typically injecting into very deep, uh, at least 800 meter. So that is typically quite far from the drinking water aquifer. Um, so in summary, we uh, think of that and we uh, make sure that that doesn't happen. Thank you. And Phil is asking, have you done any gas cloud? Uh, I. Could you elaborate on what do you mean by when, gas? When you look at uh, geophysics of uh, gas reservoirs, occasionally you'll find a fracture or um, a geological structure that's uh, broken and you'll get a gas cloud rising through the layers and it'll blur out the fault structure that the gas cloud is leaking through. Um, so have you done anything to try and see what would a uh, gas cloud would look like from a CO2 uh, fracture leak? Uh, I have not uh, done anything on this area. Um, I have seen work that uh, I've collaborated with people that predicts in reservoir with fracture. Uh, with, when, when, when fracture presents in the reservoir, these type of models cannot be directly applied. And people have been using graph neural network to uh, predict for a uh, system with fracture. Um, but I don't think they have looked at gas cloud either. Um, thank you for bringing this up. And I think I will uh, definitely need to look into this. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, can I ask you a question about the UFNO and why do you use, uh, sorry if you explained that bit, but why do you go for a unit based FNO rather than using the normal, the vanilla FNO? Because it, it worked better or because of the, what the sure. you can bring to, to the table? So um, 
with the original FNO, um, you can see that we are breaking down the information into um, into the four-way domain with these continuous function representation. And because we're superposing a lot of continuous function, it has a difficult time when predicting a large jump. So for CO2 storage, when we inject, the CO2 fo will form a sharp uh, saturation front. Uh, we, we call it shock front in uh, multi-phase flow. And this shock front is a very challenging point for FNO. So the UFNO actually mostly applied to this shock front. So maybe I can show this. You can see that there is a clear jump between the saturation part and the reservoir uh, that does not have gas. So um, adding that unit uh, here. Uh, so this, uh, this this figure actually is the original FNO. Um, I did not put the UFNO architecture here, but the UFNO just appending another unit parallel to this FNO route. So that is responsible for predicting at the shock front um, discontinuity. And that really helps from our experiment. So that's kind of like, um, because unit is used in segmentation, kind of like adds the capability somehow? Yes, exactly. UNET is really good at um, discontinuous. Um, mm. discontinuous. Okay. Yeah, because in my experience, what I was basically trying to do is like, I cropped this image to make it like 256 by 256. And then there was a padding of just zeros. But then the FNO was like naturally moving towards that padding. So it was protecting something there, but maybe like using the, UF, the UFNO, it might just like stop it at the boundary. Um, well, so, I boundary tried. is always a little challenging for FNO, but UFNO definitely helps with boundaries uh, and sharp interfaces. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think I might try that actually. Yeah. Um. Are there any other questions for Gaga? Well, if, if not, I think we, we can leave it up to here. Let's stop the recording now. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, for all your amazing work. And thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone, for attending.